we're back again. <laughs> we're very, very bizarre. Very bizarre. We were just cut off. <laughs> yeah, just we got just cut off. Cut off. Yeah. Um, what was I saying? Um, I, I don't. I don't know where we left off, but I hope people jump right back on board. I've got all the super chats saved, mm, mm. and uh, let's see if people are going to come back on board. Let's wait a little bit, Alexander, for everyone yeah. to rejoin us, because yeah. you were in the middle of something, and then it just, just everything push. just froze. <laughs> froze. Yeah. Everything just froze, and we just got booted off, and then it came back again for a little bit. Yeah. And then it just ended. Just like 100%. that. No. So uh, that's why people are coming on board. I apologize for that, guys. We don't know what happened. Absolutely. We don't know what happened, exactly. But uh, let's hope everyone gets back on. We had a good conversation going. And you were in the middle of yeah. saying something, Alexander. I, I, you were yes, I mean, I, what we were talking about was the fact that Putin has now become... Yeah, you were amazing. describing Putin, they're saying, yes, yeah. Go, go on. That he's yeah. becoming... That he's becoming um, increasing uh, that he's become increasingly demob happy and is therefore able to talk about subjects like liberalism and immigration which are difficult for westerners to absorb and um that um the interesting thing for me was that he was doing it unprompted in other words that he was not being uh, he was not talking about liberalism or globalization or uh, uh, uh immigration in response to questions from uh, uh, Lionel Barber, who was interviewing him. He was coming up with these points, um, you know, entirely of himself. And a lot of it looked to me as if he was basically thinking aloud in uh, uh, ways that are not really very typical of Putin, actually. Usually, he's a very disciplined uh, person when he's interviewed. And he's very, very careful to stick to the specific subject of the question but on this occasion he was going uh, uh, far off on uh, uh, tangents what um, the British certainly the British journalists would certainly see as dangerous ta tangents and um, it was it was very very remarkable to see how he did it one thing I would say about this interview by the way and those comments is that um, of course a lot of people if you look at the uh, newspapers here in Britain they're talking about Putin being triumphalist, that he's triumphalist at the way that liberalism um, has become obsolete. I didn't find anything triumphalist about this um, interview at all. On the contrary, he was saying right at the start how difficult the world situation has become. And one of the reasons why he thinks it's become so difficult is because of what he sees as the prevalence of liberal, or I prefer anyway to call it neoliberal ideology, because uh, without straying too far from the subject, I think what many people today call liberalism and what Putin was calling neoliberalism in this interview has very little connection with the ca classical neoliberalism of uh, uh, J.S. Milne or Voltaire or whoever. <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah. well, it would seem not. Yeah, well, I know. Well, I think I think it was actually Skype that did this to us. I mean, I think it was, came from YouTube, actually, but wherever, whatever it was, whoever. It, yeah, they're all colluding together. Well, there's the collusion for you. OK. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, absolutely. There's no question about it. The, uh, Putin will definitely want to talk to the Saudis about the Iranian situation, just as he talks. Oh, oh they didn't hear. They didn't hear my question. They didn't hear my question. Sorry, guys. Uh, my question got muted. The question was, do you think that uh, Putin will be speaking to Saudi Arabia about Iran? And do you think that uh, Trump will be speaking to Saudi Arabia about Iran? Absolutely. On both counts. I mean, Putin will certainly be talking to the Saudis about Iran, and he will be making very clear to the Saudis that he does not want an escalation in the conflict with Iran, and he does not want to see a crisis in the Persian Gulf. And um, Putin's 
um, um, national security advisor, Nikolai Petrushev, who met with John Bolton and Israeli Security Council uh, uh, chief Ben Shabbat in Israel um, a few days ago, very pointedly used the words uh, when he was discussing Iran, a, a, a friend and ally, which I thought were really quite unusual. I mean, the Russians have always avoided speaking of Iran, about Iran as an ally. But, I mean, he will definitely be making, Putin will definitely be making points to the Saudis that if there is, a, if there is an attack on Iran and the Saudis support it, they, the Russians will not be pleased. And that the Saudis, who are looking to cooperate with Russia on oil production cuts, uh, need to bear that in mind um, if they want to keep a good relationship with Russia. And as for Donald Trump, of course he will be talking to the Saudis about Iran. For Donald Trump, Saudi Arabia is one of the key, one of the critical allies in this conflict between the United States and Iran. Okay. Let's see. Valley S, thank you for your $20 super chat. Imre for five pound super chat from the UK. Thank you, Imre, for your super chat. Let's see. GD1990. Thanks for the impartial news. Guys, can you recommend some books to read? And can you also share your opinion oh. on Yuri Bezmenov? Alexander, some you, books now, to read. Yuri, Bez Yuri Bezmenov. Well, 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 I mean, you can see perhaps that I read lots of books. Um, um, I, I have, by, by this point in time, uh, I find it difficult to actually recommend any specific book to read. I mean, it, 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 if I have to say which book for me was formative in my in establishing my in, understanding of international relations, I would say, um, I, I'm sorry to, to say this as a Greek, but it was Thucydides, Thucydides' history of the Peloponnesian War, because that for me establishes the realist view of foreign relations. Um, if you want to um, understand more modern foreign relations, I would recommend anything by A.J.P. Taylor. I think he's an outstanding uh, historian. If you want to read about the contemporary uh, politics, the political situation around the world, well, in, Ru in about Russia, anything written by Richard Sackwa, uh, and about Ukraine, anything written by Richard Sackwa or Stephen Cohen um, is, going, is, is, is extremely good. Um, about the United States, it's so complicated over there. Um, I don't think there's any particular good book that I would recommend, actually. Okay, Alexander, can Alexander Mercury state the principles of liberalism? What are the principles of liberalism? I, I think it relates very much to individual liberty. And um, individual liberty includes liberty of expression. So when liberals go around placing bans on people, uh, uh, um, um, uh, you know, trying deplatforming de them and doing all those sort of things, that is not liberalism, it, by, as I understand it. That is authoritarianism, which liberalism is totally opposed to. Now, the liberals, liberals do have, uh, um, classical liberals do have other ideas. I mean, they've always tended to be very strong on private property rights. The, I should stress this was never a particular, that was never the central tenet of classical liberalism. But they do tend to be strong on property rights. And in my opinion, actually, private property rights have also been eroded a lot in the West. I don't think that they are uh, 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 as respected as classical liberals would insist. But as I said, liberalism was always about freedom. And if you really want to know what classical liberalism is like, the people who approximate to it most closely, I would say are the libertarians in the United States, not the sort of people who call themselves liberals today. And Alexander, did you speak about Yuri Bezmenov as well? Your opinion on yeah, Yuri Bezmenov? I, I, yeah, I, I, I forgot I'm to, afraid, to mention that. I'm, I'm afraid that's partly because I don't know. I actually know who Yuri Bezmenov is. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 this is this is a name that is new to me. Um, um, I, 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 if the uh, questioner could tell us a little bit more about him, because 
Um, um, I, I mean, I simply don't know him. I don't know him very well. Is he a is he a philosopher? <laughs> I'm I'm throwing it into Google right now. Yeah, and this is yeah. It, Known by the alias David Tashu was a Soviet journalist for RIA yeah, Novosti but, and a former uh, KGB informant who defected to Canada. Ah, KGB well, defector Yuri Bezmenov yeah, predicted Bezmenov. modern America 34 years ago. Well, he. Oh yes, most... I know who he is. Yes, a good ah. question. There was a video that was floating around. He was a KGB defector, and he predicted, basically, how the how the U.S. would end up as it is today. Right. And it was a pretty. It, it, the video went viral on YouTube a, a while back. So he was. He's quite obviously a very intelligent and prescient man. Well, all I can say in that case is thank you to the person who mentioned him, and I will follow it up and listen to this vi to this uh, YouTube video. Uh, um, one can't see um, and hear and read everything, even when you drink from mugs. Like <laughs> you were drinking from your mug back then. That's why. But yeah, someone uh, York yes, I... says to check his video out. Yes. Alexander, oh, exactly. I'll shoot you the link for that video. That's a good question, and we'll get to that question on another live stream because Absolutely. this guy really did. He kind of, and it's a long video. He kind of runs yeah. through. Yeah. You know, this is like way back in the in the seventies, I guess seventies, eighties. Oh, wow. I'm not sure. And he just kind of runs through how, you know, the empire, the American empire, is going to progress, and yeah. how we're going to get to to where we are today. So it's, interesting. It's it's a good video. Yes. Uh, York said Yuri was spot on. Technocratic world order. Yeah. yeah. Well, there right. we are. I'll shoot you off that video. Thank you for that super chat. Yeah. Megawit, thank you for your super chat. Ten dollars. Nigel, ten pounds. Nine ninety nine pounds super chat. If EU lifts sanctions, does Alexander think that the Russian market will not be as it once was because Russian domestic productivity has grown considerably to the extent that imports will be reduced? Oh, absolutely. I don't think there's any question about this at all. I think that the Europeans. Uh, will find that many of the markets they, they used to have in Russia have gone. I mean, where Russia was a major importer of food products from the West, it will, from Western Europe, they will find that the Russians are now producing their own food. Much of it, by the way, of extremely high quality. I mean, if you go to Russia today, the quality of food there is extremely high. And the Russians don't have GM food, for example. I mean, they're very careful about things like that. But, I mean, it, it is high quality. And also, um, a lot of products, a lot of industrial products um, that the Russians used to import from the West, they are now increasingly making themselves. So we've seen over the last couple of years the Russian machine tool industry starting to revive. Well, we've seen much more progress in the Russian gas turbine industries, we've seen uh, uh, Russian um, AI technologies. The Russians are investing very heavily in AI technology. And again, they're, they're looking to reduce their dependence on the West on these things. And I get to say something else. It's not just that these, pro these markets have gone. It's also, I think, to a great extent now, Russian policy not to make these markets accessible to Western exporters in the way that they once used to be. So that whereas once upon a time, the attitude in Russia was that, you know, we weren't going to, we were, we were going to revive the car industry, for example, by uh, um, persuading Daimler to build lots of factories in Russia to build Mercedes cars. Now the Russians say to themselves, well, we're still happy to have Daimler here, and Daimler has recently opened a factory, but we will make our own pre 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 premium cars, as they've just done by launching this new Aorus range of uh, uh, executive and luxury cars. So the country has changed, I think, to a much greater extent than many people in the West understand. Okay, super chat from Azar Joma, five pound. Thank you for that super chat from Paul, five pound super chat. Hi, guys, have joined the Duran yeah. Patreon. Thank you, Paul, for joining yeah. our Patreon. And it's Easy Virtual Assistant for anyone needing transcription services. Yes, guys, Easy Virtual Assistants. I'll give a plug out to Paul. Paul uh, Alexander, as you know, helps us, uh, actually does a lot of the heavy lifting and the transcribing of the videos, Absolutely. helps us to put together the ebooks. 
Guys, mm. Easy Virtual Assistant, Paul is awesome. He does a great, great job. Thank you, Paul, for mm. all the work that you are doing. We really appreciate it. And we have two eBooks coming out on Russiagate very, very soon. Let's mm. see, Killer Ice Lollies, 10 pounds. Super chat, listen to you guys all day long. Thank you, Killer Ice Lollies. And Johan, five, uh, 10 euro super chat for supporting the Duran. Thank you for that super chat. Clade Duran check breaking news Alexander from Clade breaking news super EU channel to allow trade with Iran circumvent yeah, US I, I, sanctions I, is now operational. What do you yeah, make of that? I, 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 yeah, I mean I saw that 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 was a comment that was made by an Iranian official, and I'm going to make a guess that that's based more on hope than experience because I think there is actually still a conflict within Iran between those people in Iran who still hope, against hope, that the Europeans will actually uh, get around to doing something to support the JCPOA, and the more realistic and hard-headed people who are now in the ascendant and who see the US uh, um, um, bearing down increasingly on, on Iran, and European promises to stand up for Iran and the JCPOA coming to nothing. Now, the point to understand about this interbank, this, this, this payment system that the Europeans have set up is that the fundamental problem of the sanctions is not so much that Iran can't use SWIFT and can't use payment systems anymore. It is that Western companies, including West European companies, are no longer prepared to do business with Iran because they risk, if they do that, being sanctioned by the United States. And they're not prepared to take that risk because they don't want to jeopardize the US market, their US market. As I have repeatedly said, if the Europeans were really serious about standing up for trade with Iran, they would be saying to the United States, if you sanction our companies for trade, doing trade deals with Iran, we will sanction U.S. companies which do trade with Europe. And people like Theresa May, who's still our prime minister, believe it or not, and Angela Merkel and Macron would be going to Washington, as I remember Margaret Thatcher doing back in the 1980s when the U.S. was imposing sanctions or trying to impose sanctions to stop Russian gas pipeline projects. And they would be telling the U.S. this is completely unacceptable behavior. And if sanctions are imposed on our companies for trading in this way, we will impose reciprocal sanctions upon yours. No European government has said that. No European government will do it. The EU collectively will, won't do it. And until I see something like that happening, I will treat breaking news stories like the ones we've just heard about how this system is supposedly operational. I will treat them with great skepticism. Okay, Alexander, let's get to um, Trump Merkel. We didn't cover mm. that one yet. G20, no. Trump, Merkel. Trump does not like Merkel. We've said no. it many times. It just shows. I mean, it really mm. does show. It. Uh, obviously, Merkel probably doesn't like Trump either. Oh, yeah, I'm sure There's no does. doubt about that. Oh, no so what's does. the relationship between the U.S. and Germany, between the U.S. Well, and the EU? How is Trump looking at things? How is Merkel looking at things? I, I, I think between, I think between uh, Germany and the U.S., it's deteriorating. I mean, I think Trump uh, um, considers that Germany has used the EU as a mechanism to depress its currency. I mean, I think like a lot of people, he sees the euro as basically a, 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 uh, a Deutschmark masquerade, the Deutschmark masquerading as an EU currency. But of course, it's a much lower value than the Deutschmark would have if it was still a purely German currency. And that has given the German export machine a huge competitive advantage because Germany, the one thing Germany is always very good at is controlling its own costs so that it could export more. And I think that Donald Trump thinks that the Germans are currency manipulators. I think he thinks that the Germans have taken advantage of uh, um, American acts, the American the access the Americans have granted to them to their markets. I think he's 
uh, sees the Germans as free riders on American security because they don't spend enough on defense. And apparently they are not going to. The Germans are putting their foot down on this and they're not going to increase defense spending to the level that the US wants them to. I think he's complaining bitterly about how countries like Germany expect the US to protect the oil and oil uh, uh, um, uh, oil supply routes through the seas, like in the Gulf, but won't do anything to contribute to that either by, you know, coming along and joining the US campaign against um, Iran. And he also doesn't like the way the Germans are, are basically standing up for Nord Stream 2. So I think for all kinds of reasons, uh, relations between Germany and the United States are deteriorating. And of course, with Donald Trump, there's the ideological concerns also. And here is where I think that there is an overlap between Putin and Trump, because I think P Trump also doesn't understand the German unwillingness or inability, Merkel's un unwillingness and inability to make decisions, just as Putin doesn't. And I think that just as Putin th thinks her decision to open Germany's doors to immigrants in 2015 was a cardinal mistake. I think Donald Trump thinks that too. And just as Putin thinks that Merkel and other European leaders are trapped inside their own ideological liberalism, I think Donald Trump thinks that also. He won't, he wouldn't be able to express his thoughts in the way that Putin does. He doesn't have Putin's fluency of language. But of course, he, what he lacks in fluency, he uh, more than makes up for, if I can put it like that, in, you know, straightforwardness. Um, and I think that for all those reasons, he and Merkel just won't get on at all. Yeah, I agree with that. No, Trump, uh, Trump definitely knows how to how to get all eyes and all attention yep. on him. Absolutely. There's no doubt about it. That's that's, yeah. that's for sure. Alexander, we have the the big meeting between uh, the U.S. and China. We don't have any yeah. news on that yet. No. But no. what? Uh, let's round it all up. What do you think uh, is going to happen there? What are you expecting? Well, I don't think anybody knows. I mean, there's there's some signals coming out of the U.S. that there's going to be a attempt to restart the trade talks uh, um, and the idea seems to be that if, they, if the trade talks are uh, um, restarted then the, U the US won't impose more tariffs on more Chinese goods it, it will simply stick with those tariffs that it has already imposed but um, there's also talk that Xi Jinping is coming along in a fighting mood and that he's not he's going to make it very clear to Trump that he's not prepared to make any sort of concessions on these issues, on trade issues at all. And it is trade at the moment which is dominating the relationship between the US and China. I mean, that is the big conflict between them. I think that the Chinese feel that the US and Donald Trump try to push them into a corner and to humiliate them over trade. And a country like China will not accept humiliation in that way. And what I'm hearing is that Chinese consumers are now actually starting, without any specific instructions, to boycott increasingly Amer U.S. goods. And, of course, the U.S. farming industry, which used to export heavily to China, and which is an essential part of Donald Trump's electoral base, is apparently now starting to feel the pain. So I think that the Chinese will come in a fighting mood. I don't think Donald Trump is prepared to make concessions. And though I think it'll be a big meeting, and I think the atmospherics may be good, because uh, Donald, in Donald Trump's mind, he and Xi Jinping get on well. Whether, they actually, whether Xi Jinping agrees, I am not sure. But though the atmospherics may be good, I doubt that anything of great substance will come out of it, except possibly an agreement to resume the trade talks. But we will see. Another big part of the G20, which is not getting a lot of coverage, Alexander, mm. is uh, our weapons, mm. military stuff. 
S four hundred specifically S four hundreds. And uh, AP has a question here. What do you think Erdogan will convince president on S four hundreds? This is big because the S four hundreds are tied into a, a lot of the U S sanctions or a lot of the threats. Yeah. For your yeah. sanctions, and you have Turkey, and you have India, which are moving to get the S four hundreds. Trump yes. announced that there's going to be a big trade deal with India earlier in the day. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if we have the details for that trade deal, no. but obviously we know what uh, what the White House, what the U.S. is saying to Turkey as far as the S four hundreds goes. What do you, what do you think of that dynamic as well? Well, I, I think that the S-400 has become this monster for the U.S. that they have largely created for themselves because India has often bought uh, um, um, weapons technology from the United States and it's not going to back off, I think, on the S-400 uh, purchase from Russia despite uh, pressure from the U.S. And, of course... Erdogan can't really back down now on this issue, it seems to me, because he's made it so much an issue of a Turkish national dignity and Turkish independence that his own prestige now, which is coming under challenge in Turkey, is bound up with it. So um, I think on the one hand, uh, with Turkey, the US will beat up very strong because I think they sense that the Tur Turkey is in a weak position. Its economy is in a, in a bad way. Erdogan has just lost the mayoral election in Istanbul. And I think they probably feel that they have uh, um, Erdogan in a tight place. And if they increase the pressure on him, even if he goes ahead with the S-400s uh, uh, purchase, which he will, um, he, he, you know, it, it, it doesn't come at any great cost to the United States if they increase the pressure on him. But India is a completely different matter because what the U.S. has been trying to do over the last couple of years, especially since Modi became prime minister of India, is they've been trying to build up India as a counterweight to China. And um, some people in India, including some people in Modi's government, have shown a willingness to entertain those ideas. But at the same time as that is happening, you see the US trying to bully the Indians to drop the S-400 purchase from Russia, which as I said, the Indians won't do. The United States has imposed uh, more restrictions, or more tariffs on India. India has re imposed reciprocal tariffs on the US. Modi apparently told Trump at the G20, that the Indians are not prepared to lift those tariffs. So we will see whether US diplomacy, what's left of it, is nonetheless able to work with the Indians and to agree this trade deal. But I suspect that the Indians will insist on their own freedom of action and they will insist on the S-400 purchase as a way of emphasizing their own independence. Okay, Alexander, Harry says, I don't think the Turks will ever capitulate to Washington's orders. And Heiko58 wants no. to know, will Turkey remain in NATO? Well, this is a very big question because, I mean, I think, I think, and this is a point that somebody, I think, made, one of our viewers made on an earlier live that we did. I think uh, um, it's, it's a misconception. I think a lot of people in the United States and in Europe think that if we get rid of Erdogan, and this you know, very difficult and... Uh, um, uh, uh, you know, controversial person, uh, um, things will somehow go back to normal and Turkey will revert to being this uh, good or obedient country that it used to be. Um, I don't think that will happen exactly. I think that there is a lot of uh, feeling in Turkey now that the Western powers, the Europeans and the Americans, have taken Turkey for granted for far too long. And I think that Turkey will always remain a more awkward country than it has been up to now. But I have to say this, I still don't believe that Turkey has any plan or intention at the moment with Erdogan or with anyone else to quit NATO. I think that is a huge step which the Turks are simply not prepared to make. And I think there is still a calculation within Turkey within the Turkish leadership and within the Turkish elite, that ultimately 
Turkey is too integrated now in the West and in the West's institutions to sever those links entirely by making the huge leap of breaking from NATO uh, uh, and joining uh, Russia and China and the Eurasian bloc that is now emerging. So I, I, I think that relations with the US and Turkey will continue to be very complicated. I agree that the, the Turks will press ahead with the S-400 sale. I agree that the Turks will try to maintain now a good relation with relationship with Russia. I don't see them completely pulling out of the Western alliance system. And um, I may be wrong, but that's my view. Okay, Alexander, Pat Buchanan had an interesting article I believe it was yesterday. He made the yeah. case that Tulsi replaced Bolton. <laughs> what do you make of that? Um, uh, Tulsi Gabbard replacing John not, Bolton. Not not going to happen, unfortunately. Um, um, I mean, the interesting thing is, of course, that I mean, as I understand it, Tulsi Gabbard is a, is a, is a left wing Democrat, an anti war left wing Democrat. Uh, um, Patrick. Pat Buchanan is, of course, a conservative Republican, very conservative Republican. But, and this is not new, um, in the United States you see the uh, um, anti-war, anti-imperialist uh, 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 feelings are there, both in the left of the Democratic Party and on the, you know, the conservative part of the Republican Party. And I think what Buchanan is basically saying is that um, people like Bolton, Bolton isn't really a conservative at all. He's a neocon. He's got a messianic mission to uh, establish hegemony, American hegemony all over the world, which is not a traditional conservative position in any way. And that, in fact, Tulsi Gabbard is much closer to uh, the views that people like him have than the neocons are. And, you know, it's possible over time that we could start to see uh, uh, an anti-war coalition emerging between people on the left and people on the right. It has happened before in the United States. And um, it's not impossible. And, you know, that may be an idea that Buchanan is floating. But basically, what I think he was saying in that article is what a completely unacceptable person John Bolton is. And he is not really a conservative at all. He is uh, a, a neocon, um, ideologically more distinct and less American than Tulsi Gabbard uh, is, who is uh, uh, maybe um, on the left but represents a strain in American thinking, which has always been there. Okay. Oh, Glock Blocky, thank you for your $2 super chat. Thank you very much. Alexander, let's, uh, let's wrap it up. We've had two, no. two live streams, one that uh, cut out, and now we have this one. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, sorry. Yeah, we, we apologize for that, but thank apologize. you to everyone who joined us on this, uh, on this part two of our G20 breakdown. Yeah. Alexander, now that uh, we have the G20 in full swing, we've had our first day and we're now going into our second day of, of meetings. Mm -hmm. Do you have the sense that the crisis and the tensions in Iran are fading a little bit? Or do you think this is just a pause before we get back to the craziness? We, we, we will have to wait and see. But I think on my, my, my sort of gut feeling is that it is abating, actually. Um, I, it's I abating. Think it's abating. I think. I, think that, I think so. I think, I think Donald Trump uh, uh, was almost maneuvered into launching this strike. Um, and I think that he looked at the consequences and the implications. And he said to myself, I don't want to go there. And he pulled back. And he's now meeting people like like Putin, who are basically telling him, you know, this is a very, very bad idea. And work with us, that's to say with Russia, and see whether you can achieve some of your objectives diplomatically. Because if you actually ramp up and go to war, what you're going to find is that we, that is to say Russia, and China also, China, it's now been widely confirmed, is still buying Iranian oil. But China also, if you attack Iran, we're going to have to stand by Iran. 
and that's not what you that's not what it seems you want so i think i think they are abating there was an unfortunate incident over the course of this week when um, some news agencies very mischievously uh, mistranslated certain comments that an Iranian official had made to make it seem that this official, I think it was President Rouhani or it might have been Foreign Minister Zarif, had cast doubt on uh, Donald Trump's mental health. But in fact, um, it was a mistranslation, one of these very, very typical mistranslations that you get with statements from Iran. And uh, um, he wasn't casting doubt on Donald Trump's mental health. He was casting doubt on certain policies that Donald Trump is uh, pursuing. But Donald Trump uh, responded to that comment with this incredible incendiary comment about, you know, bringing Iran to oblivion. But I think that um, cooler heads are now, um, are now um, in the ascendant. Let's hope they remain so, because with the likes of Bolton and Pompeo and Gina Haspel on the loose, one can never be sure of anything. Yeah, absolutely. We'll leave it there. All right. Thank yeah. you, everybody who joined us on this uh, on this chat, on this live stream. Yeah. Sorry for the interruption. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's, it's all right. We had, a, we had a good turnout for both live streams. Thank yeah. you to everyone yeah. who is on Patreon, on Subscribestar, that's donated to us on PayPal. Thank you to everyone that has bought merchandise. We really appreciate everything that you guys mm. are doing for us. Hit that like button. Hit that subscribe button. Um, you know, the YouTube is really, really keeping our, our, our exposure down especially yeah. on the suggested uh, videos part. So, you know, guys, just spread the word and, and share the channel with everybody you know. And, and you know, let's grow the community. Let's, let's make a push to get to 100,000 subscribers. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. The Oracle in London, Alexander Mercurius, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Mm -hmm. Have a good Friday night. Have a good tea. Saturday. That's right. And the tea. Wh which tea were you drinking um, today? Uh, it was this is Russian caravan. As I said, oh, I, yeah, I, the first I, those, one. Yeah. Those of you that showed, I, uh, well, I showed it. I showed it here, which is in the uh, first part of uh, the video. This, you showed it. Yeah. Uh, the first part of the video. As I said, um, it, 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 it's a, it's basically a Chinese tea, but um, it's of a style that was developed in the 18th century for the uh, Russian market, and it's it's what the kind of tea you know that Catherine the Great and Peter the Great and people like that would have drunk. Um, I. Don't, I haven't actually seen it in Russia, but it's certainly in in Britain. It's a well-known brand, a well-known style of tea. This is a this is the Fortnum and Mason version of it. But those who watch old Russian films or read Russian movies and you see these sort of samovar things, you know, these bubbling things there. Well, uh, th that's the kind of tea they're drinking, and I'm drinking it from one of our Duran mugs. This is my wife's mug with the coat of arms of Moscow and what more appropriate way to drink Russian caravan tea than with a Duran mug with a Russian Imperial Eagle on it. That's right. From the samovars, the tea and the samovars. That's right. All right, guys, take care. Have a okay. good night, everybody. Bye.